Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Assemblyman Mike Riley. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the sa uh, School Safety Task Force by the Minority Conference of the New York State Assembly. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, uh, joining me today and co-hosting uh, is uh, my co-chair for the uh, School Safety Task Force, Assemblymember Doug Smith from Suffolk County. Uh, I'll pass it over to him uh, in, shortly. And I have Assemblymember Michael Tanousis, uh, who represents uh, this district and uh, PS8. Uh, we thank you for coming out and participating. Uh, I just want to do a little uh, housekeeping. Uh, first, I want to thank our Minority Conference staff for all their hard work uh, putting this together. Uh, we actually ha held our first uh, task force meeting in Suffolk County last night, and it was a nice two-hour ride. I felt like I was on the SS Minnow, uh, but, you know, I made it back in time. Uh, tonight is our second one. We have two more, up in uh, one in Rochester and one outside of Buffalo, and then culminating with a fifth one in Albany. Uh, so the staff that has actually helped us, uh, Betsy Graham, Matt Visser, Frank Valenti, Tyler Carey, Rob Morgan, uh, my chief of staff, Peter Jinter, and uh, Assemblymember Tanus' uh, chief of staff, Hanan Debjat. And uh, so they've been doing a lot of work, and I really appreciate them, and I want them to know that we thank them. And uh, so what the, the intent of this is, is for us to gather best practices uh, across the state when it comes to school safety. And so what I'm here to do is to gather that information listen to it with my fellow uh, members of the assembly and our co-chairs for the task force. And at the end, we're hoping to culminate a clearinghouse of information that can help both urban and suburban school districts in creating safety. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn the mic over to assembly member Doug Smith, my fellow co-chair. Thank you so much. And just to echo this, uh, we're greatly appreciative to the hosts here today and our great staff that are helping us as we travel the state. Uh, you're all very well represented by uh, two members here that have an extensive background in law enforcement and keeping communities safe. So to that regard, we are trying to extend that to the schools. So thank you for having us. Uh, thank you so much. I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, one of my favorite elementary schools here, PS Public School 8. I'm a neighbor. I live down the block, as, uh, as many of you know. So I'm very happy to be here and to be able to address something, uh, an issue that has come up recently, especially here on Staten Island, and that's uh, how we can make our schools safer. Uh, something that I know that myself, Assemblyman Riley and Assemblyman uh, Smith, are uh, really serious about. We want to listen to this feedback and take it back with us to the legislature to actually implement changes that need to be made. So with that being said, I'll turn it over to Co-Chair Assemblyman Riley. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd be remiss if I did not thank Principal Esposito for graciously hosting this meeting and uh, thank you for, uh, for having us. So with that, let's... Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we have a, a first panel uh, for discussion. And uh, what I'm going to ask is that uh, they present uh, for roughly five minutes, uh, whatever they can present on best practices. And I'm so honored to have them. Uh, here with us tonight, we have Mr. Rampasant, the Chief Officer of Safety and Partnerships for the New York City DOE. I think I might have left something out there. But, all right. All right. <laughs> we have uh, Ms. Agnes Mc, uh, Macbeth, representing uh, District Attorney McMahon. Thank you. And we have uh, Inspector Timothy Wilson, uh, the Commanding Officer of the 122 Precinct. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to them. And uh, Mr. Rampasant, if you wouldn't mind starting. Wait, thank you very much. Uh, can you guys hear me out there? Well, first of all, thank you again to the principal for being such a gracious, gracious host. Um, and condolences for our friends in, uh, at Wagner College who's got to sit through this. I heard that the, uh, your, your professor made you sit through it, so we'll, pro we'll try to be as entertaining as we possibly can. All right? I was told you got to go through this in order to get to the next step, so. All right, so thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, thank you for our, our elected partners for continuing to support our schools in the way that you do. Um, Mike, you are a champion and an advocate, um, always keeping us on our toes. So I appreciate you, not only is for the work that you do um, in, in Albany, but just 
a friend and always transparent and really holding us, holding us to the fire around safety for kids. So I appreciate you for always being a champion and look forward to working with my new friends on the other side as well. So thank you in advance. Um, now that I've schmoozed over and made some friends in the room, I uh, want to talk a little bit about what, what we're doing in terms of keeping, keeping schools safe and what we want to do in the future in, in order to support our schools. One of the things that we, I, want, I want to echo, and I want to really not only echo from a prior conversation, but really um, start off with is the responsibility of school safety is the responsibility of every adult in the community. Right? Not only do we have a, a fundamental responsibility for keeping young people safe physically, but their emotional safety as well. We can continue to talk about the pandemic and what we've endured in the return of our young people back to school with the different challenges that they faced on the outside and not having the supports readily available to them that a school provides. But if you think about the school from the perspective of the, the, the center of the community, just think about the provisions that our principals, our assistant principals, deans and, deans and others provide for our young people. That's what they were really missing during that time. So we were, we were intentional about laying the groundwork to prepare our young people to return back to schools. And we ensured that there was the emotional support in place. Every one of our schools has a social worker or a guidance counselor or a school-based health clinic that provides mental health supports for our young people to ensure that outside of the nurturing adults that were there to receive them at the door as they transitioned from day to day, they have those supports in place for those conversations that need to be held in private for some of the things that our young people endure on a regular basis. When we think about school safety, we continue to think about the hardening of school safety, locking the front doors, the school safety agent at the front door, metal detectors in some schools, and the, and the marching of uniform presence through the hallways to keep our young people safe. But what about the emotional safety, right? In every one of our schools, needs more of exactly that, the emotional safety. When you think about a young person who picks up a firearm and decides to shoot up a school or a neighborhood, just think about what they endured before getting to that level, right? And I, am, I, am, I speak all around the city, and one of the questions that people always ask me is, what is the Department of Education doing to keep kids safe? And I intentionally stay quiet for a second because I want to allow the person who asked the question to absorb that for a second. When you think about that as being the sole responsibility of the Department of Education, we're missing the mark, right? We're the education department. We educate young people, right? There is no system where we're handing um, um, dangerous items to young people as they transition into our schools. They're coming into the schools with those, right? Every school's not a metal detection school, and I am not advocating that our schools all be metal detective schools. I am saying to you this. We have a fundamental obligation to keep our schools safe. And when I say we, I'm talking about the collective village. I'm talking about the merchants. I'm talking about the clergy. I'm talking about the community partners and stakeholders outside of our schools have a fundamental responsibility to work with this principle right here and simply say, what do you need from me to help you help our school community, right? And so outside of the work that the principal is doing to keep young people safe by conducting her drills as outlined by state law, right? Her building response team as outlined by state law. Her conducting her regular drills, lockdown, evacuation, right? And shelter ins as she's required to do. Having a building response team that practices every month and they meet on a monthly basis at their safety committee meeting to discuss the different ways by which they can keep their school community safe. Outside of all of these things, the principal still needs the support of the community to ensure the safety of every young person in the building. And some of those things come by way of town hall meetings like this and being able to say to parents, here is how you can help. Parent volunteers. Right now in our city, we're having a major shortage as it relates to school safety agents. School safety agents. So when the question is asked, what can you do for us in Albany? My answer would be, let's have a conversation about a prevailing wage that makes sense so that we can compete with some of the other city agencies that are taking our school safety agents. Right? The school safety agents make such a low wage 
that many of them have opted to take jobs in Starbucks, Target, and um, in some of the other places like Walmart that it now, will, now will pay for your college, right? Instead of working here where in order for them to make a decent salary, they have to work to 10 o'clock at night. Some of these agents have been at school since seven o'clock in the morning, but they're still here burning the oil to keep us safe, but we won't have a conversation about a prevailing wage for school safety agents. So when you think about what can we do to help keep schools safe, that's one conversation that I would say, start that conversation in Albany about how we can make this, this job of school safety more competitive to some of the, the agencies, such as the corrections department. Think about where we must be as a city when a school safety agent would rather not work with children, but work with inmates in order to pay their rent or their mortgage on a monthly basis. Shame on us as New Yorkers to stand by and allow that to be our story. Shame on us, right? And these are the very people who stand at the door as the gatekeepers to keep the bad actors out of the building, right? To keep the bad actors out of the building. Just think about that for a second. We want them to put their lives on the line, such as the case with our partners in blue, but we don't want to pay them the right wage to do that, right? And one would ask, what is an appropriate salary for a school safety agent to put their life on the line for a kid? I would say to you this, I'm not sure of what that salary is, but I can tell you right now, it's not the one that they currently get. And when you have a conversation about school safety, the first thing we think about is the school safety agent in their uniform at the front door, greeting parents, greeting students by name, and some of them are parents of the students themselves. And they're sitting in schools providing safety for young people and hoping that that same level of safety is being provided for their child in the school down the block. So the job of school safety is not the Department of Education's sole responsibility. We show up for the job every single day. And, and, and I can tell you right now, this principal and her team does an amazing job of ensuring that safety. But when we talk about safety, what exactly are we talking about? Right, so when the young person comes into the building hungry, well, is that safety? Bad night at home because they were on a punishment and something happened with the parent and they come into the school and we are able to talk them down, is that safety? A young person who is being physically abused by a parent at home and comes to the school for support, is that safety? A young person who is, is struggling with sexuality and they come into the school and there's a person to provide guidance, is that safety? Right? It's not only the physical safety that we're responsible for, and when you go back to Albany, when we have a conversation about safety, we need to talk about the overall emotional safety for our young people as well. And that conversation comes by way of guidance counselors and social workers. And when we have a conversation about mental health accessibility to our young people, let's really talk about what is available in the community, not only for young people, but their families as well. Right? And I'm, I am intentional about including those particular areas in the conversation around safety because we continue, we continue to think when we talk safety, we're talking about the physical safety. When a young person chooses to hurt another young person, there's a backstory. There's a backstory. And that backstory usually comes from everything and anything on the outside. Yes, young people are cruel and sometimes they're mean to each other. Yeah. That is the case, but hurt people hurt people, right? There's always a backstory to be told, and the sooner we can get to the backstory, the quicker we get to the backstory, the quicker we can prevent some of what we're seeing around the country from happening in our schools. And some of our best practices are, is exactly that. We want to ensure that every school has a crisis team, and that crisis team is available to support any young person who is in fact in crisis. And crisis looks different to each and every one of us and depending on who we are and what we consider to be a crisis. Breaking up with your girlfriend, that's a crisis for a teenager. For me, looking at that bill after my daughter comes back home from Bloomingdale's, crisis. <laughs> crisis. I need all the help that's available to, me, available to me at that time, right? I appreciate you. I appreciate you. But crisis, right? Nevertheless, and our young people deal with different crises every day. Here's one crisis for you, and I challenge you and ask you in Albany to do anything and everything you can do for us. Help us with social media. You want to talk about safety for young people, right? And we have no mechanism in school to deal with social media. 
these young people have a greater platform than anything that we could ever have thought about for ourselves. Social media, hold them accountable for allowing for a stage for one young person to bully a young person and you can bully them from here in Staten Island to Japan. And you have people chiming in, chiming in, chiming in, but guess what that is? That is the emotional safety for our young people to the point to where a young person would consider taking their own lives. And in my entry conversation outside of greeting, greeting my friend Mike was having a conversation with my partner here, the principal, about exactly that. Mark, the last time I spoke to you, we spoke about a young person who committed suicide from a school not far from here. And just the other day, he called me again about the same exact thing. And I say to you this, we have work to do. And the work that we have to do is a collective work. It's not an individual work. It is a collective work. And that collective work includes all of the members of our village. We're showing up every day. We need our members of the village to show up as well. And that village is not absent our partners in Albany. We need to have real conversations on how we support our communities in a way that we can self-sustain. No parent, no student should be thinking about ways outside of school where they can get the very supports that they need to sustain. If I am having a problem with depression, where do I go? If I am having a problem with bullying, where do I go? If I am having a problem just being able to feed myself, where do I go? It can't continue to be the only place that many of us think about, the school. The school, we have the sole responsibility, right? We have the sole responsibility. We spend more time with your children than many of you do. We have them all day. They're in clubs, they're in, we think about it, they think about it, we create it for them. We have some schools in our system that have as many as 50 different clubs for young people to join because they don't want to go home. There's nowhere for them to go. There's nowhere for them to go. I have just accepted, and it's okay if you throw potatoes and tomatoes at me, accepted the responsibility for the PSAL in this system, right? The athletic league for our young people, right? And when I took this challenge on, Mike, I said to myself, one of the first things that I want to do is I want to ensure that all of our athletes are ambassadors for their schools. Just think about the quarterback. Think about the pitcher. Think about the, the point guard on the basketball team and think about what his following must be in the school. A winning school. I'm not talking about the ones that are 0 for you get the rest. Right? I'm talking about a winning school and you have a, 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 a championship winning team and just think about the influence they have on other students. Think about that influence, right? And I, I, I want to create a space where they're ambassadors for their schools. That's safety. That's using safety in, in the responsibility of safety in a different way. But I also thought about how many young people we touch through the PSAL, and I thought about the different ways by which there are young people who are athletic in a different way. And I thought about how we use gaming, esports, as sports for the PSAL. Just think about it. We have young people who actually earn income through esports. And we haven't introduced that to the largest school system in the country. That's another way by which we keep young people safe. So I'm hoping that I've given you something to take back to Albany and have a conversation around what the needs are for our school system. I am hoping that I've availed myself as a, 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 a point of reference to take back to Albany and say, member of the village, I've raised my hand, I've tapped in, I will continue to support every one of our 1,400 buildings, 1,800 schools throughout the system, one million, depends on who you ask, young people in our school system, and I will continue to tap in every time I'm tapped in. I can't tap in with social media. I can't tap in when they're in the bedrooms of your homes. I can't tap in when the doors are closed and they have privacy to do some of the things that many parents would say, not my child, until it actually happens. I can't tap in and control the things that I am not in control of. But I will control the things 
that I am in control of. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Now I'd invite Ms. Agnes Macbeth, please, representing uh, District Attorney Michael McMahon. Wow, that's a, a tough act to follow, and um, I don't want to say polar opposite, but um, uh, um, we are a village, and I will agree with that. My name, again, is Agnes Macbeth, and I'm uh, one of the community liaisons in the District Attorney's Office, and I'm also... Um, the education liaison for the DA, and I am additionally a public school mom. Um, I want to begin by uh, giving regrets from the DA that he couldn't be here. He had a prior engagement. Um, but this is a conversation that we, uh, we've been a part of. Uh, one of the first things that I did when I joined the DA's team back in November was to attend um, a school safety forum that um, I believe Assemblyman uh, Tanusis headed along with Representative Maliatakis back in November. So we've, I've been a part of those conversations. The DA has been a part of those conversations um, over the past few weeks. And um, he's met with safety agents, with UFT, we've met with uh, principals, with parents, and um, with every conversation, the district attorney asked a question. If you had a magic wand that would erase the discipline and safety issues that we're facing in our schools, what would it be? What would you do? And um, I must say, we, we heard some similar themes that I'd like to share with you today. And uh, for us, they sound like common sense some of which you've already heard, um, but I'd like to dig in a little bit deeper because yes, schools need resources. Um, on Staten Island, there are 144 safety agents for 93 sites. 143 for 93 sites, down from 159 agents, agents at the start of COVID. Um, so that, that needs to happen, that needs to change. We agree 100% that we lose them for a myriad of reasons, uh, largely dealing with the pay. Um, we're, we're not ignorant of that, but uh, this lack is felt at the school level. Um, the district attorney is in favor of metal detectors, more metal detectors, because we found that uh, scanning simply isn't working. Uh, even random scanning, when, when kids are aware, are made aware that uh, scanning or wanting will take place, or when they see the cars out front and they know that that activity is coming, then we found that they simply ditch their weapons until those protocols are, are not in place. And so it's important that we keep our children safe but um, say physically as well as emotionally. Um, we also believe that we live in a 21st century where metal detectors are becoming commonplace. If we go to a concert or to a basketball game or we go on vacation, our children go through metal detectors and we don't want a psychological effect where students feel that they are entering an unsafe environment. We just know that in the absence of all of the resources that you're mentioning, and we know that those things will take time, that there's a real need in the immediacy that needs to be addressed, and, uh, and some of those issues stem from things that possibly can be fixed sooner. Uh, like we know that with the previous mayoral administration, there was a change to the discipline code. And we were told uh, um, by someone in safety that that change has resulted in bad behavior instead of discipline, where students know that um, if they commit certain offenses on school property, that um, they'll either get, uh, they'll get, uh, a parent will be called and the matter will be taken to family court 
or the, the <coughs> item that they, the, the weapon that they bring into the school will be confiscated and vouchered, but there aren't too many more con um, consequences beyond that. And so we don't believe that we should penalize kids aggressively um, because we know kids will be kids and we know that things happen, right? But we also know that in the absence of a suspension, uh, a community service, or some type of consequence, um, then there are those that will take advantage of that. We've seen in communities that there are adults that um, use children to carry weapons because they know that they won't suffer as severe a consequence if they're caught. And so we believe that there should be, the DA believes that there should be uh, common sense consequences that meet the crime or the, that meet the offense. Um, we don't want to take anyone's uh, uh, future away from them. We don't want a kid that's about to go to college and uh, to make one bad mistake or, or, or um, be involved in a situation where they might have to defend themselves and their future is irrevocably changed. We don't want that, but we believe that there should be consequences for those who break disciplinary codes. The, di the district attorney strongly believes that. Now, mind you, we, he also, and we also believe that with those stronger, um, more common sense disciplinary codes, that resources should be met with it. So we're not saying just, just a suspension or just an in-house suspension or, 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 or the like, but couple those disciplinary actions with the resources, with counseling, um, with more preventative measures while we're dealing with the action. Um, and that if we show students that both exist simultaneously, then we will see a uh, real change in, in what's happening in the schools. Um, and for parents and, and law enforcement and all communities to be in conversation about what's actually happening in schools and what we can do. And we believe in YCO programs and strengthening them. We need more YCOs. Uh, we, mean, we need more NCOs, those that engage uh, young people, get to know them. Uh, meet them where they are um, uh, and have conversation with them. And for twofold reasons, to not only get to know children, but also to gain their confidence so that they can have a conversation with them if they suspect that something is happening in their neighborhoods. But we know that children, kids are coming into schools with well-disguised weapons, disguised as combs, disguised as uh, keychains, and um, uh, we, we want to mitigate the, that influx of weapons that are being brought into schools. I believe that's important that we can do that, uh, that the DA believes that we can do both. We can do sensible, uh, enforce sensible, sensible disciplinary codes while advocating for resources and, and the like that will keep our children safe because the bottom line is, yes, safety is uh, not just physical, but it's also emotional. But if our children are afraid to come to school, and if they are afraid to walk to and from school, then that impacts learning as well. And so we believe that you can address both sensibly. And so we thank you for inviting us. Thank you uh, both for, uh, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And we're also here to hear from all of you. So thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Inspector Timothy Wilson. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, um, so I'm here to represent uh, Chief E. He's the borough commander. Unfortunately, he couldn't come tonight. Uh, I am the commanding officer of the 122 Precinct. I'm Deputy Inspector Timothy Wilson. Um, so the, the NYPD's uh, policies are uh, voluminous. Um, and, you know, uh, they. The bottom line, though, is is the, the, the police department, uh, we take the stance that we want to keep every student safe. Um, they come here to learn. They come here to come to school. This is, this is an environment for uh, education. Uh, we are in favor of the metal detectors and, and all, the, all the different types of uh, scanning. And we do a fairly good job with it, I think. 
Um, we can try to measure that, uh, you know, temper that with, uh, you know, not scaring anybody either. Um, and, you know, unfortunately we are in a little bit of a, uh, a, um, a, a staffing issue with our school safety agents. Uh, it's being worked on. Uh, we have some wonderful agents and I've had the privilege of working with a lot of them. Um, and, uh, you know, just in my little world, in, in this precinct, uh, you know, the, the, the crime in the schools is very, very, very small. Um, in fact, we, we have just, you know, little dust-ups here or there. I know there were some things last year at certain schools. But those are aberrations, some bad apples. Um, and the, the police department as a whole is committed to the safety of the children. Personally, I'm the parent of, of some public school children. Um, you know, my kids went through a, a public school and an intermediate school. Uh, we were very happy with the, with the way they were uh, they were treated there. Uh, they we always felt they were well supported, uh, which to your point I agree with you. There's there's more to it than just clamping down. Unfortunately, on my end, I'm the clamp down uh, group. I'm the one that comes in and, and arrests you and takes you in. Um, and you know I can only speak for myself in terms of general policies, but you know we don't tolerate weapons at schools. Um, we're not going to have that. Our children deserve to come to school and feel safe. Uh, and that's our goal. Um, in, in policing and law enforcement in general, one of the main tenets is fear. Uh, we want to reduce fear as much as possible. Uh, and you know, I think our, our agents do a fantastic job um, reducing fear. I know from my own personal experience and my own children, our agents were great. Um, both schools they attended, they were, uh, they were wonderful. They cared about the kids and, 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 and like Mark said, they knew them by name um, and I was super impressed by them. And, uh, and now in my role here, um, I, I, I get to meet with, meet with a lot of them, and they genuinely care about your kids. Uh, I personally like to see more in the schools, because the more the better, but um, what we do have, they are dedicated. They should get paid more, but uh, I don't really have any say in that. I wish I did. Um, but the, the bottom line here is, 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 is like, like my colleagues here said, uh, it does take a village. Um, we, we find that uh, when we bring a child into the station house for some kind of infraction of law, um, and we have to take them into custody. Uh, the parents, you know, it, it runs the gambit. We have to have people that come in and go, what do we need to do to fix this? How can we help and to work with us? And then we have other ones that come in and be combative with us. But uh, it is certainly, uh, uh, generally, it's, it's when, when everybody's on the same page and we're all looking out for the children, uh, that they succeed. And that's what, uh, that's what my, you know, personally and, and professionally, that's what we want. We want success out of our kids. Uh, it's nothing, no, nothing makes me happier than visiting the schools and seeing the smiles and, you know, seeing them all get on the bus and waving and, and whatnot. And it's, uh, it's certainly uh, a, a privilege for me to be part of this. And uh, I look forward to being, you know, more involved in the conversation because it's cer certainly something that um, we need to do. These kids need our help and they need guidance. And that's what we're here for. So thank you for your time. I'm here to listen and uh, I'd love to hear any suggestions anyone has. Thank you. Thank you. So I appreciate uh, all your comments and insight and uh, definitely uh, will help us. Uh, one of the questions uh, that I'd like to start with is when it comes to communication. Uh, communication between agencies and specifically uh, New York City DOE communication with their school communities. Uh, is there anything you can see the state helping with uh, that we can bring to the legislature bring to the executive branch uh, advocating to help that communication and are there any mandates that may hinder that communication from happening so Mike if you could be more specific in terms of communication do you mean the school's ability to communicate with parents do you mean the system's ability to communicate with schools just uh, I appreciate a little so, bit more clarity so twofold yep communication between DOE and other agencies yep. like FD and PD, and the second part, communication of the schools to the school community when, say, there's an incident. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that question. So um, we all live in New York City. Um, not all of us have the, uh, the uh, I'm gonna say, privilege to work for a, such a large bureaucracy, and you haven't had the experience of trying to communicate with other agencies. One of the most difficult things in the world to do. Mike, can I give you an example of something? Had a young person in crisis the other day, went to the school, talked to the principal who knew intimately what his uh, particular concerns were. 
And after an hour conversation, we learned that this young person was involved or touched by seven different city agencies. Family court, correctionals, uh, family court, probations, Department of Education, NYCHA, ACS, I can go on and on. Not one of those agencies talked to each other because there are all of these preventative federal laws and requirements that don't allow us to speak to each other. For the schools, you have FERPA. For the medical, you have HIPAA. And I can go on and on and you can add a uh to anything else, right? It exists. And what that does is that disallows us from communicating with the different agencies. And when you think about what you can do at the state level, we need to create a way by which we can break those barriers down when it is for the sole interest of the young person, right? We're not talking about creating databases. We're not talking about creating a system that allows us to track a young person from elementary school to college. We're talking about a system that allows us to talk collaboratively about the supports that we can provide collectively as a city to ensure that our young people are whole, our families are whole. Right now, if you're a family and you require public assistance of any kind, right, you gotta go through the system and you have to give all your information, and then you go somewhere else and you need housing supports, so you have to do the same thing over and over. If you need Medicaid, you gotta go and do the same thing over and over. But all of these supports are being provided by one city. So why isn't there the ability for the city to communicate with the city to provide all the services at one shop? Right, so if you can't get that together as a city, it is very difficult for me to get it together as a city talking to another city agency, right? We have an agreement with ACS where we can provide information to ACS. Guess what? Principal can't get any information from ACS. Probations, as a part of the stipulation for young people who's released, the principal can give information, but the principal can't get any information. Right, so how am I gonna support this young person who's being supported by seven different agencies if we can't communicate with each other? I say to you this, Mike, it's bigger than just the city in order for those conversations to take place. So I say in order for us to create a system where we can all communicate, we have to get, and I'm sorry for the lawyers in the room, we have to get the lawyers in the room, right? And the lawyers have to come up with a system by which information is provided and then deployed for the, for the direct support for a young person, betterment, if you will, right? Not for the intentions of creating databases. And as it relates to the, the principal's ability to communicate with the parents when, a, when an incident transpires, um, this year, a new system was created, Gamma, um, through our IT department, right? And we are late to the game. Let me say that in advance. The DOE is truly late to the game. Gamma is a system, it is grades, attendance, uh, messaging, application. And this application gives our schools the ability to send real-time messages to parents who are registered in our NICSA system, the student account system, send them real-time messaging. It's a brand new application, we're late to the game yet again, a brand new application that will allow real-time notification to go out to parents in, in, um, when, a, when an unfortunate incident transpires or when the principal simply wants to invite you to a PTA meeting, right? Every parent, every teacher, and every student can receive real-time notifications from the principal's cell phone or computer, text messages, emails, or even a phone call home, right? So it's a new system, really getting acclimated to our school system to get it out there. We're thinking about ways by which we can send out monthly safety, safety updates to parents, and we're thinking about ways by which we can send messaging from our partners in the police department to families around safety, especially during holidays like Halloween and such. So they're out there, and the way by which um, Albany can support us in this respect is create ways by which those barriers don't exist in Albany that will allow me to talk to my partners in ACS and them talking back to me in probation and family court and um, the other agencies, right? Because that far, you know, outweighs the work that we do here as a single agency trying to reach out for help. Something like a, something like a carve out. Okay. Anybody have that? If I may add just yeah. a point to that, um, I would love to see such a device once it's created to truncate down to the school level. 
when there's a transfer student, if a student transfers from one school to another because of a disciplinary action or for whatever reason, that information does not follow them. So the principal of the new school is not aware, is not made aware of why they are receiving this student until, unfortunately, an incident occurs and then somewhere their, their information, some of the information is accessed and then they find out that this, this student had a history. So if such um, a device was created, um, it would be good if added to that piece was an ability for principals to have conversations with each other, um, deans of safety, school, safe, uh, school safety on the ground to be able to share information from school to school, which right now does not happen. Thank you. Thank you. My question, um, so the, both, I guess, the district attorney of Richmond County uh, and the mayor of New York City uh, have made no bones about the fact that they believe uh, that certain actions that have been taken by the legislature in the past few years uh, has led, and, and by the way, we believe in that as well, uh, has led to an increase in crime across this city. Uh, my question to you is, and, and I, I guess Mark, this is more of a citywide question, is what effects do you think those laws have had? Uh, well, actually, let me rephrase that. Have you seen that increase in crime that we've been facing across New York City, has that affected our schools? Uh, and have, have you seen it in our school system? I appreciate reframing that question. <laughs> so what we have seen um, in the last year, well, not the current year, but the last year, and I'm tracking right now, is that um, the condition of the city has led to more weapons being brought to schools, right? And the interesting thing is, Many of those conversations around weapons have included parents, and parents have said things to us like, I've equipped my child with that taser. It gets darker earlier. There are people on the streets with mental health issues. Think about some of the things that have been happening in our streets, right? And parents are afraid. Young people are transitioning, right? I, this is the honest truth. I work down the street from one police plaza on the corner of Chambers and Broadway. There is a guy sitting at a table that looks just like this, and he's selling pepper spray. However, when a young person comes to school with a pepper spray, they're disciplined. Although mom provided it, they're disciplined, right? And these are parents who are saying, if, the, if we're not gonna take care of their kids, they're going to equip them to take care of themselves. To answer your question, the answer is yes. 6,000 weapons were confiscated in New York City public schools last year. And many of those weapons were confiscated by way of the enhanced random scanning, unannounced scanning that's going about the city. 21 of those weapons were firearms, of which 16 were found on a young person. Half of those weapons were found in non-scanning schools. And you know why? Because young people feel comfortable enough that when they see something, they say something. And young people saw young, other young people with weapons and they went and they told. And when interviewed, those young people said, I'm fine in the school. I'm not fine when I transition through the school. Our young people transition sometimes through five boroughs to get to high school, right? They transition throughout the city. They don't have to go to the community high school. They can transition off the island. They can transition on the island, the other side of the island to go to whatever high school they so choose, right? And when they're transitioning, sometimes they have to transition through some not so great neighborhoods and have some not so great interactions on the train and otherwise. You see what's happening on the trains lately. All right, I am saying that that's a small percentage of the people who are like a, a blip on the radar, but nevertheless, when the press is highlighting someone being pushed on the subway, on the train or stabbed on the train, that makes you kind of think about riding the train, right? Doesn't stop ridership, but it makes you more alert when you're riding the train. Right? And it is evident that um, there is some change in our, our city as it relates to the, the, the way by which guns are being addressed. I mean, think about my poor principal who has to endure just yesterday a firearm in a school. How do you deal with that as a school community? What does a principal say to parents about a young person who chose to bring a firearm to school? 
And in the conversation, once again, with this young person, he said that on my way to school, I have to pass through a neighborhood where I have a problem, so I brought the firearm with me. And interestingly enough, he chose to bring a firearm with him to a school that is a scanning school. So just think about that. Either he wanted to get caught, or he just woke up on the wrong side of the sleepy bed. Right? But a choice was made in that respect. But the good thing is, our amazing school safety agents, they got it. Right? And so how do we prepare for that? Right? Stricter laws? Is that going to help us? Right? I can say to you this. We tried to arrest our way out of this situation. We tried to suspend our way out of this situation. The fact of the matter is, we have to deal with the situation. Let's meet them where they are. If young people are not feeling safe on the street, that means we got some work to do in the street. Because if they weren't feeling safe in school, you'd be holding me accountable and making schools safer so that they feel safe in school, right? And collectively, we have a responsibility to our community, and I'll say it again. It's all of our collective responsibility to ensure safety. Yes, there needs to be some conversation about the laws. No question about that, right? I don't know enough about laws to tell you whether they need to be more stringent or we need to sort of throw the book out. But I do say to you this, if a young person is arrested on Monday and back in school on Wednesday, we need to have a conversation, right? A firearm arrest. I'm not talking about arrest for a box cutter. I'm talking about an arrest for a firearm. And you show up back in your school community on Wednesday before I had an opportunity to hit the checkbox on your suspension, we need to have a conversation about our laws. So it, it, it's interesting uh, for me to be here as somebody who represents uh, the suburbs on Long Island because half the state operates schools very differently than how it, it's operated here. And there's uh, differences uh, that, and, and some flexibility that I think, I, I know our school districts out on Long Island and throughout the state kind of wish they had the ability to kind of have a one-stop shop in some regards because uh, you know, you're able to operate a little bit more efficiently in certain regards than uh, us having you know, 100 and some odd school districts. Um, so I'm listening to, to these things being said. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the school safety agents? Because the rest of the state, uh, we're dealing with an issue that we have school security guards that uh, there's no licensing, no credentialing. Um, school safety agents, they're members of the police department? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And is this a specific um, civil service line? Yeah. Like this is, so this is where the pay comes in? Yes. And they're active duty? Yes. Yeah, for, forgive my, uh, just because... No, it's no problem. That's, it's very it's understandable, because it, it it's, it's, it's a very strange dichotomy with the, with the way we do things here. Um, so we have, um, in the police department, there is uh, uniformed police officers. Um, we kind of differentiate those with the guns and those without. Okay? Um, so I am a uniformed member of the police department. The um, school safety agents, along with our traffic agents and other um, civilian members of the department that do wear uniforms. It's, it's kind of a little strange because they do wear a uniform. Um, they're committed, commit, uh, considered civilians. So they have peace officer status, which is just under the police officer status, those of you that are familiar with the criminal procedure law. So what they are is they are um, attired in a lighter blue shirt than, than, than their uniform, than the regular uniform officers are. And they are tasked with the security of the schools. There's an entire hierarchy of, of rank and, uh, and supervisory structure in that side of the department. There's an, a whole division for it. It's overseen by a uniformed, I believe it's a, a one-star chief right now. I'm not, don't quote me on that because they keep changing it. Um, but they are uh, a, a civil service uh, job. You take an exam. There is a whole training period. We put them through a whole academy. So they're, they're very well trained. They're, ver they're screened. It's not like you just walk over the street and like, I want to do this now. Uh, it, it's a whole process. There is an entire interview process. There is uh, paperwork background checks. There are uh, vetting processes. Uh, there is physical, uh, a physical component of it. There's a, uh, an educational component um, where they, they do attend classes. They're, they're very well trained. Um, and, you know, and then they're, 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 they're given the authority. They're, given, they're sworn in. They, they, uh, and then they're assigned to a school. And they're, they're basically tasked with this, the, the security of the school and the safety of the students for that, you know, while they're there. Backed up by my uniformed police officers and our youth officers and, 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 and other, other assets of the department. Uh, so for example, there's one here. So she, since the main entrance, she's guarded. She has um, arrest powers. 
Uh, she has a lot of training. She, basically, she's just not armed. Um, and you know, it, it, it plays a, it, it does play a certain role for us because you know we don't want children scared, and we're not trying to criminalize children either. You know, but I, I do agree with Mark that the consequences, and from the police department's perspective, the raise the age law has significantly impacted that um, to where it's 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 made it very difficult to uh, have consequences and have uh, people held accountable for their actions when clearly they are in control of what they're doing and what, they, and what, what, what they're aware of, you know. Uh, but to, to answer your question, there is a, is, a, is a complete division for them. They are very well trained, very well vetted. You can't just get hired at, like as an agency. They're not contracted out. They work for the city. They are under our, our jurisdiction. They are completely under our control. We work, it's a, you know, we work with the Board of Ed with, with, with some of the policies, um, but they, they answer to us. So you know, in a, in, a, in a weird way, the, 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 the agent that works here actually works under me because I'm tasked with all the schools in this area. However, there is a whole division that oversees them operationally, administratively, uh, and, and, and how they discipline and how they, how they conduct their business, their individual training, because it is different than a uniformed officer's training. And that's actually a key part of, as we're traveling the state talking about this, I think we're definitely mm -hmm. going to look at that because mm -hmm. we don't have that for the rest of the state. Right, right. Uh, and those are conversations that are happening. Uh, the next thing I wanted to ask about, uh, the metal detectors question, and uh, not really a question, just listening to both sides and the thoughts on that. Uh, previously, I was a high school math teacher, uh, so I uh, have more of the, you know, uh, not the law enforcement background that my colleagues have, but the education, the <laughs> kind of like, let's, uh, you know, help everybody get through um, what they're doing. So uh, when we talk about social media, do you have any ideas of what you would like to see? Because, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I think. Uh, we may have to, at least as one element, upgrade uh, maybe the uh, crime of harassment to include by electronic means, maybe. But, but again, that doesn't, that doesn't answer the full question because we want to make sure that students are not attacking one another 24 hours a day and causing these mental uh, health issues. So think about it, right? Um, if you went on any social media site right now and typed in young people fighting, what do you think you'd see? You'll see gangs of young people jumping on one person. You'll see gangs of young people having fights that if their parents saw this, they wouldn't believe that that's my child acting in that way, right? But social media allows them a platform to celebrate that bad behavior. So when you ask what would we like to see from social media is them not allowing for young people to freedom of expression, right? For a young person to express freely that kind of behavior, right? Young people are in packs committing these heinous crimes against elderly people, right? You get to put that on social media? You get to ride around on your moped and jump off your moped and record yourself robbing someone at gunpoint and then you get a thousand hits and you put your name on it? Now, so here's the interesting piece. Some would say, yeah, let them do that because that's how we catch them, right? But think about a million views. That means I am victimized a million times just in this, this state alone, across the country, right? Just think about that, right? People decided to take their phones out and record while a woman was being raped on a train in another state. Nobody thought to help. That is our instinct right now, right? And so we blame our young people for doing the very thing that they're trained to do. And Take I've out spoken, their phones. To, to, that, to that thought, actually, I've spoken with uh, students in, in schools across, uh, at least on Long Island, and uh, students were trying to teach student advocacy. So come up with an issue you'd like to see, try to advocate. A lot of these high school students are trying to advocate to their school administrators, we'd like to be able to use our cell phones during lunch. Sure. One of the reasons why that is not being allowed is for that reason that you say, that things are being recorded that shouldn't be recorded. And, and so it actually is much easier to just say, I don't want to see that phone, put it away, because that, uh, that motivation, as you mentioned, to become famous or something like that. Um, the last thing I'll say, because I definitely uh, respect your time and I wanna, we want to bring everybody up, um, two other issues. So uh, unlike other parts of the state, a lot of your facilities are not just being used by public schools, but also non-public charter schools. How is that impacted? You know, how, what's the responsibility? Who secures those schools? 
I know the, the, and I, for the record, and I don't speak for my colleagues, but for myself, uh, and again, my district doesn't have any charter schools at the moment, but I've been very critical of, of charter schools because I feel that they're not regulated in the same way, but again, this is my speaking solely. Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I'm not going to be critical of charter schools. I got a so long way for retirement. We're not critical of charter schools. <laughs> okay, got it, got it, got it. All right, I'm not at retirement yet. So, um, Long Island, sorry. <laughs> so, as it relates to safety and security for the charter schools, I'm going to be honest with you, I can't answer that. Okay. Um, because they are separate and apart, and they don't follow Chancellor's regulations, if you will. So, the school safety agents are not assigned to the charter schools. They have to get private security for those facilities. Um, there are very few charter schools that actually have a school safety agent present, and that's because of some other extenuating circumstance. But our schools are co-located, co New York City public schools are co-located with many charter schools, and as a result of them being in a co-located building, they get the school safety agent coverage. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, I, Mark, I have a yeah. last question just to, to wrap up, sure. and it goes around something that we've discussed for many years. Uh, about locking uh, the front doors uh, from my time before I was in the assembly and the community education council. Uh, but I also want to wrap that into two, another point. Okay. And I think we may, we may agree on this, uh, and I know we have conversations on this often, and I brought this up while I was a member of the CDC as well. Uh, polling sites in schools, uh, early voting opened our doors to our schools. Uh, I've been constantly trying to get our schools removed from the list of early voting sites. Uh, what is the challenge that we have with securing our schools during polling sites? And what's the status of the doors being locked? Uh, for instance, in Suffolk County, in our, in our uh, meeting last night, all their schools, the doors are locked. Uh, if you can just touch on that, maybe give us an update. Thank you. Absolutely. I knew Mike would not let me go without the hard question. Um, so let's take the, the, the voting sites first and foremost, right? Obviously that's a bigger conversation than the Department of Education because the Board of Election takes precedent over on Election Day, right? And so that's a, that's a, a, a fight that a continued battle on um, the DOE, Department of Education has sort of the most real estate, right, in the city and that's why we're chosen. Right? We would prefer community centers and churches and other places like that, but um, on election day they take precedent right? because everybody has a right to vote without any level of interruption. Right? And so those are conversations that are still happening around can we have them identify other sites, but the question is in some neighborhoods the only sites that exist are schools that will allow for that space. So it's a tough conversation and a conversation that is continuing. Right? Um, and as it relates to the locking of the front doors, let me be clear, let me move up to the mic for you, Mike, on this one. Mike Riley has been the champion, the champion on this fight of locking front doors. We've had many discussions with our partners in FDNY and our partners in NYPD, the building departments and others. And this is probably the first, this is the first um, administration that has taken the conversation about locking front doors as seriously as they have. And over the course of the summer, we've met with a number of vendors, and we had a particular vendor create a prototype that we are considering for our school system. It's something, uh, the best way to describe it is it's something like your ring system at home, for those of you who have the ring system. It's a two-way system that will allow the school safety agent to see who's on the outside of the door and be able to buzz them in, right? Communicate with them, see them, and then buzz them in. Right? And the, the reason why it took a little longer to, to um, create a prototype that works for schools is because every one of our schools is different in shape. Um, the doors are different. Some of our doors are made of pure glass. Other doors are, still have asbestos in them and, and you know, all the different reasons why you can't drill. Right? And um, we had to find a system that works, a universal system that works for every one of our schools. So we've introduced a prototype that we're trying out on a number of schools as we sort of tour the circuit around funding. This is a big ticket item. Um, funding and um, having the conversations around sort of the pros and cons. Our schools are safe havens for our young people. When something happens and a young person is dismissed or on their way to school, the first place they think to run to is the school. 
And some of the concerns that we had is having a delay in a student who's running back to school for entry. We've had four cases, not this year, but the prior year, where a domestic violence case took place and the victim ran to the school for help because they know that there's a uniformed school safety officer at the front desk and they have arrest powers, right? Um, and one would think, you know, what would you do if you can't get into the school and someone is, right? And then the others would think, well, that's one person versus 500 students who are in the school, right? And you get the rest. So we have now um, finalized a, a, a particular um, item that we're going to introduce to schools shortly. The conversation is always about funding and uh, the, the, the um, funding source to make this come to fruition. But this chancellor is steadfast on making door locking in our school system come to fruition for all of our schools. We are introducing a prototype for one school in every borough. Um, and I am happy to say that I've found the school in Staten Island that I want to make to be my prototype, just because she's so awesome back there. Um, and you can come and see, you can soon come and see the prototype that we're introducing. Parents will, parents will have to comply. You will not be able to get into schools without the school safety agent clearing you at the door first. So unlike the case that we had in Queens where we had a mentally disturbed person make his way into the security desk and fight with the school safety agent to the point to where a principal had to get involved and bring this person down, we want to make sure that we eliminate that as a possibility in our school. So Mike, you've won this battle. We are now introducing, <laughs> introducing. <laughs> so we are, we are now introducing into our school system um, door locking systems. It's going to, we're going to lay it out, um, starting with our elementary schools, simply because they're the schools with the single agent in the building, and then we're going to kind of gradually um, get it out there. Uh, there will definitely be announcement, an announcement around um, time frame um, once we've established the funding source, and I think that we're 90 percent there. Thank you, Molly. That's, yeah. your words are too kind, but this is a partnership sure. and, and it's all about relationships, so thank you. Yes, I, mean, I just want to add, uh, the DA will be happy to hear that because he's strongly in favor of locking doors as well. But in our conversations, we additionally um, uh, met with groups who recommended that in addition to that, because that's for active shooters and for incidences inside of school, right? But if we had a community of, of safe havens, businesses and um, uh, the like, that were near school grounds that if there were instances a student could run into and be safeguarded um, uh, in the Bronx. Uh, Virginia. Uh, exactly, Virginia, where um, there are signs on businesses that if a student were in trouble or in peril, they can go in and the business will close so that until a child is safe and, uh, um, and officers can be called to intervene. So that's another um, avenue to combat this issue as well. That supports the, that supports the conversation about community, Absolutely. right? So we talked about the merchants having a responsibility to keep young people safe, so it would be, it would be great. What's, what's very interesting, Mike, um, and then I'll shut up, I promise, is that we've had several conversations when we explored the idea of locking front doors, and it's very interesting the number of parents who were solely against the locking of doors. 100% against the locking of doors, right? They gave us excuses like, how do first responders get into the building? How are FDNY, NYPD going to get into the building to provide the service? Currently, when you uh, visit a housing development in the buildings, they have the doors locked. Mm -hmm. And there is a single point of entry um, for first responders. Um, and they've done things like their ID chip allows them access to the building right, to get in. So those are the things that we had to consider, and we considered a three-fob approach, uh, a, a three-pronged approach. One is a fob, one is a keypad entry, and one is ID in order to get into our schools. And we even thought about a second point of entry in the event that the front door is going to lead you to the point of danger, right, back door. So we've, we've thought about several, several things, but there is one thing that I really want to share, and I promise I'll shut up after this, Mike, and that is, 
while we have the conversation about our school safety agents, right, and I want to end on this note simply because we continue to talk about the value of our agents, but not, of, not, not enough of us go outside and advocate for our school safety agents. Our school safety agents are doing an amazing job of supporting our school community and keeping young people safe. Not only do they know the names of the students and the parents, and they are partners in the community, they are also residents in the community, and they're doing a heck of a job of, of keeping your children safe as they transition to and from school and while in school. But here is something very, very interesting. I'm not sure of how many of you remember the defund the police movement that transpired a short time ago. There are folks who are advocating for school safety agents to be out of our schools. Advocating for school safety agents to be out of our schools. And the reason why I intentionally wanted to end on this note, Mike, is because their voices are louder than those voices who want to see the school safety agents in our schools. So I say to you this, the way by which we get more school safety agents and we get a prevailing wage is that your voice is louder than their voice. Thank you for the opportunity, Mike. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your insight, all three of you. I, I can't thank you enough for being a part of the panel. Uh, we're going to have a second panel, and uh, I'd like to call up uh, Lou Bushi, uh, the lead principal of Strategic Partnerships, Family and Community Engagement, and Mike Capitelli, the Senior Associate Superintendent of Schools for the Archdiocese of New York. Thank you so much. I'd also like to uh, acknowledge we have Stuart Kaplan from the UFT Safety and Health Representative. Thank you, Stuart. So Inspector Wilson said that he wanted to stay on in case there's any, uh, any questions that the NYPD can help with, or uh, especially since they partner with our uh, both public and private schools. Uh, so this is a prime opportunity. I thank you both for uh, joining the panel. And uh, did you guys draw straws to see who would begin first? I don't think you did. Uh, so uh, we'll lead with uh, Mr. Bushy. Thank you all. I'm honored to be here, uh, be part of this work, be part of moving and, and advancing the work that we need to do in our community. Of course, Staten Island, my name is Lou Bruschi. I'm here as a designee for Dr. Wilson, uh, our District 31 Community Superintendent. I was listening to the panelists earlier, very excited to hear really two points that everybody was making. We need to uh, uh, be sure that we're building the village and we need to be sure that we're working together with law enforcement to uh, uh, to, to support what's needed to get the bad actors out of the places where they are causing the most difficulty. On that front, there are really two, uh, two things that the district is taking uh, very seriously and moving forward with. The first is an initiative called Project Pivot, which brings together community support through uh, different agencies. Uh, right now on Staten Island, in District 31, we have eight schools uh, are part of the Project Pivot initiative. Uh, in addition to those eight schools, we have New Dope High School, which is part of New Visions, a separate district, but the eight schools that are supported by it, uh, IS-28, IS-49, IS-72, Port Richmond High School, Tottenville High School, Wagner High School, and Curtis High School. Uh, the goal is to bring more resources to those schools in the schools and around the schools. So the, the work of Project Pivot is to expand safe passages inside and outside the schools and around in the community to provide additional mentoring in the schools to the students and to the families with anti-violence, anti-gang initiatives, and all of this supported by clinical social workers coming from social service agencies that are on Staten Island. So it's people in the community supporting the community in the work that's happening. We're very excited about this work. Uh, it's a coordinated effort with our school safety division, but so much of what we do on Staten Island is, is very well coordinated. You know, uh, uh, Mr. Rampersant was talking about the challenges of that communication in the formal networks, but as you said, Mike, there are so many uh, uh, relationships that are in place 
that support what needs to happen on Staten Island. So most of our school leaders and certainly the members of our district team are in constant contact with uh, members of NYPD to be sure that safety is in place, whether it be the NCOs, the YCOs at the school level, interacting with our principals on a pretty regular basis. And then at the district level, uh, making sure that we're in touch with uh, uh, people like Deputy Inspector Wilson, uh, Captain Waldhelm, uh, uh, Deputy uh, Inspector Kinsella, and Deputy Inspector Smirnoff. And then most recently, we met with uh, Detective uh, Derek Brown to support the Borough Command and be in coordination with them as they're responding to island-wide issues, uh, which I, I guess is what uh, Inspector Yee is uh, addressing in, 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 I'm sorry, Chief Yee is addressing in most of the spaces. So ma many different of these aspects we're, we're working on building the village, as Mr. Rampus had said, and then also addressing the bad actors in the community with the right supports coming from uh, uh, NYPD and working in cooperation, coordinated, coordination with them with the district office. Thank you. Thanks for having us, uh, Assembly members. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Um, on behalf of the Archdiocese of New York, our school superintendent, Michael Deegan, Cardinal Dolan, uh, thank you for, for hosting this important forum. I'd like to just, um, uh, you know, briefly touch on a few things that certainly are important to the non-public school community, but also is no different than some of what you hear today. And, and it's good to be here. I see Lisa Esposito, the principal here, who I've worked with for many years and certainly uh, so gracious uh, to have the DA's office uh, and certainly the NYPD, who have all been very good uh, friends and, and supporters of all the schools on Staten Island, uh, both public and, and non-public. So um, just share a couple of things which I, we hope would be helpful uh, for you as you think about uh, how the New York State Assembly and how uh, the uh, bureaucracies in, in the state and the city could work with some of our schools. So first is I want to thank you because you were instrumental um, in the uh, budget that just passed this past year, there is an allocation for school safety money for non-public schools. So for public schools that come through their state aid runs, for us it's a little bit different. We access it through the non-public school safety equipment grants program. And so there was an increase in that and certainly we're grateful to you uh, for, for providing that funding. And that things like locking the doors in Catholic schools, all front doors are locked. There's an intercom system with a camera and uh, you know that, that uh, in order to allow uh, entry to any individual so uh, so that's one of the things that we do with the funding uh, lighting for example at night there's many events we're here at night so lighting in the surrounding area is another thing of how we utilize uh, those funds um, so just two uh, things that I'd like to touch on first is uh, you may be familiar with uh, New York City has a security guard law for non-public schools now I know you're not the City Council so you can't change the law and I'm certainly not asking you to to do that, but uh, one of the things is that law is based upon what is called the BEDS report. Mrs. Esposito, she, she does one for public schools, I do it for the non-public schools, our principals do it, it's the same thing, you know, a lot of data entry, a lot of different things. But one of the things that's, that's interesting is, and this is a state education department form, is that they don't count three-year-olds in a school building. And so for our students, um, uh, for our schools who have three-year-old students, and by the way, we have 3K and UPK programs in our schools, city programs, the same as public schools have. Those students don't qualify for a security guard. So it's just simply, you know, a simple, um, you know, change in the form that would allow additional, our additional schools in the, in throughout the city to qualify to have uh, security guards through the non-public school program. And the reason why we receive this program is I saw the wonderful school safety agents outside and certainly grateful to them, uh, not only for their work here tonight, but their work throughout the school year. And so this is the equivalent of how our students access uh, school safety agents. Um, it's the school uh, security guard program in the city. And so um, that change was something that would have to happen at the state education department. So that's one that I'd offer to you. And, and if you think about it, um, this, the number in New York City is 300, so 300 students. Uh, but for a school nurse, the city law is 200 students. If we were to increase the school safety in New York City, the school safety law from 300 to 200, an additional 32 elementary schools in the Archdiocese of New York would qualify. So significant number there. And then the last piece, so you may have seen uh, today a recent news, uh, newspaper article that the city is now gonna recognize uh, Diwali as a holiday. And that's great, 
But the challenge that we have in the non-public school community, whether it's a Catholic school, yeshiva, whatever it might be, is that we're limited to school busing by, the, by a certain number of days under state law. And so when you think about it, we have students, and especially on Staten Island, we face the same issue. They're traversing Highland Boulevard, three-lane highways, Amboy Road, and for them to walk or to get to school, it's difficult. It's a safety issue. And so looking at how uh, non-public schools could access additional busing for these additional holidays that the city is putting in, because it's codified in state law. There's only, a, I think it's five, if I remember off the top of my head, state holidays that we're allowed to ask for an alternative day where the public schools may be closed, but we might be open. So Jewish holidays, um, uh, and really any holiday, right? But, so it's very limited. So I would encourage you, if you could look at that, uh, as well at the state level, that would be something that uh, would be helpful to the non-public schools as well. And then, you know, certainly we have an extensive uh, array of, of mental health and social emotional learning, which is really a need for all students now after the pandemic. And so just looking at how New York State Oasis funding perhaps might be uh, expanded, uh, we, we receive, and we, uh, as well as I know the public schools, uh, they have Oasis counselors, or I think they might be SAPIS counselors, Lisa, you could correct me if I'm wrong, um, the Sa uh, SAPIS council in the schools, we need more. We need more funding for counselors in our schools because that, especially now, after the COVID uh, crisis, it certainly is a need. So happy to answer any questions, but thanks for letting me share some perspective. So Lou, I, I have a question that, uh, one of the things that we mentioned last night at a town hall meeting, we spoke to uh, district representatives, so specific district representatives. And for those of you that uh, may not realize it. New York City is considered one district under state law, uh, but we are broken down into 33, I think, because we have 32 districts. geographic districts, plus we have special districts. Uh, but so taking it just as a Staten Island perspective, as if we were, say, equivalent to a, a, our own school district in the state, when it comes to uh, reporting uh, incidents like Verdier, right, the, the violence uh, reporting system with the state. Do, do you see any, and, and being with your prior experience as a principal of uh, an elementary school and a middle school, do you know, can you offer any insight or recommendations into what improvements could be made? Not, not too broad, but what you think are the immediate changes that should be made to that Vadir to make it really relevant and break the stigmatism that's applied with it when a school is identified as persistently violent? I, I think over the last few years, what, what's happened with what, what we call in, in New York City our ORS reporting system, our online occurrence reporting system, what we've done uh, to, to balance it with what's happening at the state level is qualify some of the things that are reported based on age level, which I think brought a very uh, uh, common sense approach to what's happening. Students in kindergarten might be touching each other in ways that aren't deemed problematic the same way it would happen in seventh grade or 11th grade. And those were changes that were made years ago that brought some common sense approaches to it. I think there are uh, uh, places where there may be room for improvement, but I don't see any significant changes that would make the whole system better all at once. I think it has to be thoughtful moves, step by step, incrementally. Uh, I, I think Mr. Rampersant is probably more qualified as he looks at those things much more closely at a citywide level to see what happens in those places and what nuance needs to be captured and then adjusted or refined. So I, I had a question regarding the non-public school security. If you could go back through that uh, for a minute. So you said for every 300 students, one security guard is uh, qualified. Is that, in, and um, so I'm curious because, uh, you know, out on Long Island where I represent, and, and as I mentioned, half the state, and we're dealing with school security officers, we have a lot of retired police officers that, that do that job. Is that funded uh, through, you know, how, how is that program funded? So it's a reimbursement program okay. to the state, I'm sorry, to the city. And it's the same thing like the non-public school security grant program is a reimbursement program. Uh, the security program is also a reimbursement program and it's through city tax levy dollars. Um, and so we apply for the program 
and it's based upon an enrollment of 300 students. But again, you know, that's a pre-K four through eighth grade. And then after 300, every additional 200 students, it is on, I think, one God additional. So there's 500 students, you get two gods, and then so on and so forth. Okay, so, so you don't have any issues with like salary caps as we have. So it, it, it pays prevailing wage according to the New York City um, prevailing, uh, New York State, I think, prevailing wage law. And um, we hire through a, a security guard companies, um, you know, the guards, they're pro for a private company and then they work in the schools. Our policy at the Archdiocese of New York, and this is, every school can adopt something different, but our policy at the Archdiocese of New York is that um, that we, we, ask, we, we deal with one particular company and we ask them to hire retired members of the NYPD, FDNY, or military service because we feel that they have a level of training that we would like to you know, see. And in addition, they also have to be licensed underneath the New York State Licensed Security Guard um, licensing program. And so I'm not very familiar with that. I'm not an expert on that. Um, I might defer to the, to the inspector who might know more. But uh, they are required to have that as well. Okay, that's perfect. Yeah, my question was more um, just making sure you didn't have an issue that the re like half the state, the public schools have an issue where any retired law enforcement is under a penalty if they make over thirty-five thousand dollars if they're retired. Uh, so that's something that uh, throughout the rest of the state is a major issue. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. I know. Okay, so in New York City, um, once you retire from the NYPD. Uh, you are not subject to um, any kind of income restrictions. You separate from the department. Uh, in certain circumstances, um, if you receive a disability pension, uh, then you'd be uh, subject to some, um, some uh, uh, salary uh, restrictions on, your, on, on what you can earn up to a certain point. Usually that's when you reach what would have been your retirement age from the department normally, when you, we, we call it a service retirement. So. Um, you know, let's say you, you, you leave the department at 15 years uh, and you, um, you get the disability pension. Uh, you, you're restricted by your income limits about for those five years. You would have reached your, your 20th or for some of our newer uh, officers, the 22nd or however the pension tier is, is uh, laid out. Um, and then they're, they're not subject to, uh, normally they're not subject to income restrictions. It's separate and distinct. It's, you, once you leave the department, you, what's that? Yeah. Once you leave the department, you become a private citizen. As a matter of fact, we, we, we actually, when the, when the guys retire, we, they have to get licensed by us to have a firearm. Right. So, uh, you know, there's a multitude of laws and, and regulations. Um, and there's the watch guard license, which we oversee, um, and where we, um, you know, we, we, we license the, the um, security guards and whatnot. Uh, and it's true. And I, I happen to know quite a few of the, uh, the men that, that do, uh, men and women that do the security for the schools. Um, but from my perspective also, if, if, if you want, um, we don't oversee their security, but I have a wonderful relationship with those, with those schools. Um, and, you know, if there's an issue, we have a very, very close work relationship uh, with, with these principals and the security staff, um, you know, through personal contacts and from, you know, from working together and from, uh, from my role. We have a great work relationship, so. Now, can I ask you just a question? So, uh, back to the school safety agents, with that title, do you have any retired members of the department that retire and then become, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, this okay. is probably not uh, for no, me to. That, now, that's something they can't do. Uh, they, they, oh, oh you, you're, right? okay. you're only allowed to, you, you, you're one or the other. You, you, you know, you don't so you get can't through. retire NYPD and then do that? No, in a second. no, okay. the, the, there's a, this whole pensioning system and this, this civil service law that takes effect. Okay. It's kind of complicated. But you, you, it would be nice, but no, that, that's not how it works. So they, okay. they generally go and work as, as the, uh, in the private schools. Okay. Okay. Great. So it sounds like actually the city has figured out a lot of the problems of the rest of the state. We still have not. Figured out. Well, maybe. Well, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, like I said to you before, we have an entire division of the NYPD that is dedicated to the school safety. Right. So that's a bit different than you're right in, in a lot of other places. So I could just to qualify that whole uh, back and forth for the members that are here that are from New York City. Outside of New York City, uh, there is a a push to hire retired police officers for local school districts, and there's an income limit for retirees. They're, they can only make up to $35,000 a year. The issue becomes when they reach October, they've already made that 35000 so it leaves two months of no security at the school for the year. Uh, and also from the first half of the year, right, that January to June, 
that counts all in the calendar year. So th that's when, when Assemblymember uh, Smith was mentioned that, that was part of the conversation last night. So that's why it might have sounded a little uh, confusing. But in New York City, uh, our public schools don't hire retirees uh, because of that uh, income limit and pension issues. Private schools, totally different thing. Retirees can work. I hope that clarifies a little bit. Uh, just a question. Um, as far as schools on Staten Island, public schools, um, do you have any idea as far as this year, 2022, if any weapons have been recovered from any public schools in, in, on Staten Island so far this calendar year? I have no knowledge of that. That's not within the scope of what I do, and uh, you know, publicly that hasn't been something that was shared with me. Got it, thank you. And, and my next question for Mr. Capitelli, have there been any issue with hiring? I know obviously you're contracting to a private firm that does the security sure. for the schools. Has there been any issue staffing, security staffing? At any so, you know, staffing is always a challenge, especially, I mean, today there's, there's staffing challenges across the board. I mean, I think that, you know, the, um, if, if there's any way to kind of um, help identify uh, retired law enforcement that would be willing to work and, and, and enter this as a consideration, um, certainly, uh, you know, I think that would be helpful. Uh, and, you know, that's something that administratively an agency might be able to do or, 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 to, or to offer. But, um, you know, we, we're, we're pretty good. I mean, there's always a challenge, especially, you know, Staten Island is, is, is fairly easy to staff. But sometimes when you get into Manhattan or the Bronx or... Uh, you know, it, ca it can become a little more challenging in order to staff. But just to, uh, be, just to be sure, the archdiocese doesn't actually go out and try to hire guards themselves. It's th Correct. This is through, it's through a contracted vendor. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we work closely with them in order to vet all the personnel. They have to undergo all the background checks and, you know, significant, you know, a hiring process. Right. And then training as well. Not only, you know, there's the school security guard training, but uh, we maintain our own school safety procedures and policies that they also have to be then, you know, informed and trained in so that way when they work in a school, they know what the response is and we're aligned, you know, so, so for example, if someone said so there was something that was to happen in a school, someone called 911, the language that we use is the same language that's used in the police department. We coordinate very closely, even with New York City D. I mean, Mark was here earlier as well. And so we try to make sure that we're aligned uh, where we can and where it makes sense. And then there's other things where we have our own policies. For example, as I mentioned earlier, every door is locked. That's a non-negotiable for us. And you know, there's cameras uh, extensively throughout the buildings. Uh, and so, um, so it, uh, it works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking part, spending the night with us and uh, sharing some insight that we can take back and uh, put together with the clearinghouse. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks. So we did have, we did have some parents that uh, sent me an email to, to speak. Uh, I would like to invite them up now. Uh, Deborah, did I, did I spell that right? Scout, Scoutro? Scoutro? Okay, and uh, Candice Strano? things you actually had brought up, um, what, the, what we really wanted to speak about, about safety in this school specifically. So we are parents of children of PS8, um, we're on the PTA, SLT, um, have been for many years. And that is about the early voting and the primary voting that's happening in the school consistently. So one of the things that obviously is a huge safety concern for us for many, for multiple reasons. One, of course, that people are walking in this building and there's no security to stop them. There are double doors from where the gym is to where our youngest children are. Those are our three, four, and five-year-olds are in that wing of the building that they're able to just, there's nobody there that could stop them. There was literally little cones, 
blocking the doors and nobody's watching to see whether or not somebody will walk into that door. Um, so having that, the people have easy access to our children in a time when our children have to go through lockdown drills for fear of a shooter, I think is something that I'm not sure how that's even a consideration. I know that for years, and obviously even when I was in public school, children are not in, in the building during a, on election day for safety reasons, right? Because there are people coming in and out of a building and for safety reasons, there should not be additional people being having access to the building. We're talking about locking our front doors so that people don't have access to the building to our children. But yet, suddenly for early voting and primary voting, it's okay multiple times a year for our children to be subject to that. Um, and only our children. And only, well, and we are the only elementary school on Staten Island that has been chosen for early voting. Um, there's only two, there's two other high schools. Three times and, a year. And our, and our elementary school with young children. But I don't only have the issue with individuals coming to vote here. I also have the issue with the people who are working here for voting. Most of them are volunteers. I very highly doubt, I don't know for sure, but I highly doubt there's any background check or anything that's ever vetted for those individuals that are coming here to work. And there, is there a background check, really? They, to, to volunteer? Well, they get paid very much. Very light, very small, don't they? But so we've had issues with their, first of all, in our, in our, on our property, smoking, which is illegal, cutting toenails, which I promise you what happened. It was it like literally sitting out in the, in the yard, in our Leaving school food yard. Everywhere. Leaving food everywhere. There was at the last primary in the spring, there was a man who was taking photos of one of our youngest children and he was stopped and we have you know, parent statements of seeing it. We've tried to go to places and they say, oh, not happened, it doesn't matter. Like those are the types of things that was somebody that worked here that is now has access to our children as they're walking in and out. Um, I don't know how it, this is not, I, don't, I can't even imagine how this is even something that, I understand everybody's right to vote, I totally get that, like I understand that. But it should not supersede the security of our children. So we've been trying for years, and, and Mike you know that we've called you, like we have tried for years to get knock on people's doors and ask who can help us and literally the, the Board of Elections want nothing. They, they don't want to hear us. They, they, are, they don't respond. They want nothing to say. They're like, there's no other place to do it. I can't imagine the city that there's no other place to be able to hold early voting. There's got to be another place. That's not going to impede on my child's security. So I, I, I will say from the time before I was on the, in the State Assembly, uh, when I was a member of Community Education Council 31, I actually introduced a resolution mandating, asking New York City DOE to close the school on all elections, but of course that was before early voting. Uh, right. So now with early voting, you know, to give some people some insight into what happens at during early voting in a school, it's for 10 days mm -hmm. each election cycle, plus that is usually, that site is still a polling site for general elections. Yes. So now you are looking at losing up to, and if you have a special election during the year, yep. you could be losing up to 40 days mm -hmm. of your gym of your cafeteria. They have recess. Uh, yeah. They can't be outside because so of security reasons. So when I first took, when I first uh, got elected to the assembly and I took office in 2019, uh, it actually, that's when I think early vo voting started the first uh, roll out and we had eight schools on Staten Island and that was part of the push of getting them to stop using schools. Uh, unfortunately, I fell short in getting PS8 off the list, uh, but I continued it to advocate for that, and I know Assemblyman Tanousis does as well. Uh, the, the issue is, and, and even though you may not <laughs> hear us speaking about it publicly, the back and forth with the Board of Elections, uh, and you heard me mention it to uh, Mr. Rampasad, we have back and forths about it, uh, because we're on the same page right. that it shouldn't be used. The, the issue is real when they say, because there has to be a certain amount of polling sites within a, a radius and then it has to comply with ADA uh, requirements, wheelchair accessibility, all those things. Uh, Peter who just reminded me sitting down there, uh, my chief of staff, he actually uh, wrote the letter for me and actually uh, asked and, and we put forward recommendations mm -hmm. so did we. to for other locations <laughs> that unfortunately did not fit in but the board of elections. In this area, that could be used. There are, but I. Ten of us at four. We would take one. 
Why do we have to get yeah. all of it? I, I, every year we get every single one. Well, the, re the reason why that is because it becomes complacency for them, right? But it's, no, no, I'm not it's saying not, it's right. I'm just saying I understand it's it. It's easy to do it. Our that. children but, are getting the brunt of everything. And it's a yeah, when it comes to when it comes to early vote, absolutely, right. I agree. And I honestly, I agree. Well, I understand there actually is legislation little. that would prohibit schools from being used, and, and we push for that all the time. And unfortunately, it hasn't gone anywhere yet. Right. And if me, it's your yes. yeah. Oh, it's so I'm gonna pass this over to <laughs> Assemblyman <laughs> Smith. Thank you. Uh, but they may not, and he, maybe he can say what happens outside of New York City because they have right. different criteria. So. Before you I'm do fine. that, I just I just want to say, I I you know I, I you know I've met with Principal Esposito about this month or a few months back. Uh, we have been in touch and working on it with the Board of Elections. Uh, but as Mike just said, that those are the criteria going forward that we're working on to try to find an alternative site. To be quite honest with you, I'm against early voting to begin with. Okay, this is my. We've always voted on. We always this, figured out how to vote on auctions. This is my voting. This is my polling right. site. Okay. I have never come here, or anybody else is voting except me, when I come here on an early voting day. Mm -hmm. So I, to me, I think the whole thing is a waste of taxpayer money, uh, and the, not to mention the money we have to shell out uh, in regards to the Board of Elections for the people that are working. Right. So I have been against early voting from the outset to begin with. Uh, but we're going to continue working to try to find an alternative site. Uh, and just because we don't talk about it, because it's a little bit political, as, as you know, with the Board of Elections, we are working on it to try to find another site uh, to do it. Thank you. And I even said, you know, one of the things I had said to Principal Esposito, too, today, actually, when, we, when I told her I was going to talk, you know, trying to talk tonight, I said, if we want to do early voting, because you're saying that people potentially on, on Election Day, they work, and maybe it's a hardship for them to figure out how to come earlier or stay, you know, or later, do it on weekends then. Like, do it, like, if you have to use, like, just do it two weekends before. Or, or, or two, three days. Two to, it's 11 days. Right. Exactly. I, or I, evenings. I, evenings and weekends. Right. right. It, Kids aren't in the school. Right. Uh, absolutely. Go for it. Well, we also have another venue, another vehicle to vote now. They may, that there's no excuse absentee voting. Right. So, right. right. You can send it in. So, right. you don't need to have early voting. Right. 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 There's access to both. Right. So, just. So, I'm. Um, carrying the bill in the assembly to prohibit schools from being used as locations. As I, as I mentioned, I'm a former school teacher. I was elected in a special election, which caused uh, a bit of chaos because special elections are not planned. So when the school set their calendar, uh, I'm out in the suburbs, as I mentioned, when the school set their calendar the year before, they had no idea that on April 24th of 2018, there would be a special election called 10 weeks prior. Uh, who knew right before then that that was going to be an issue, that, uh, that there would be even a vacancy. Uh, so under that, uh, on the general election day, most schools do close. That's one day. Mm -hmm. But when you have primaries, you can't account for those. You don't know if an area is going to have a primary. You don't know if somebody vacates their office, there's a special election. So those are issues. And then now we have the early voting for the primaries and the special elections and the general. Uh, so now I will tell you, because this has been an ongoing discussion, um, so I, I had a bill regarding uh, not permitting schools to be used uh, one of our majority colleagues from Westchester, Sandy Galef, she carried it in the assembly on the other side of the aisle. I'm a Republican, she's a Democrat. Uh, she had, I believe, withdrawn her bill. Uh, I will tell you there's been significant pushback from the Board of Elections, which uh, state Board of Elections and many county board of Boards of Elections. Now, what their argument is, they're um, trying to say, you know, we, we want to enfranchise people. We don't want, we want people to be able to participate in this process. Now, under state law, it doesn't actually say that a uh, location used for voting has to be a nonprofit or a governmental building. Uh, in fact, on Long Island, one of our polling places is the Bayshore Ford dealership. Kind of crazy to think that a car dealership would be a polling place, but it is. So the fact is, under state law, it does not require that. So there is a balancing act, uh, and I, I think that's going to be something we continue with. Um, previously, my predecessor in the assembly had a bill that would approach this differently, that would permit uh, school districts if, if a school building um, felt that that was not something they could um, handle, now again, this was pre-early voting, that it would give the authority to the school to close for that day. So if there was a special election or a primary, unexpected, they could close the same way a snow day would be incorporated, in which case uh, now you have a snow days anywhere in New York City. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no more snow They're days. virtual days. Virtual days. Wow. <laughs> Wow. We lost our snow days. Some of the school districts I represent, some of the school districts I represent have gone in that direction. And I kind of 
you know, frown as a teacher because I, I think that school days actually can be helpful for students to wonder and enjoy, but, uh, but I digress. But uh, on that, you know, but to that same regard, if, if that was enacted, uh, we still have a mandated number of days that students must be in instruction. Yes. Uh, and actually with that virtual option, that makes it even less prohibitive. Now you could, now again, we talked about early voting. I was unaware that this was an issue. I know Mike has, on the floor of the assembly, you've brought this up, this specific issue when we were debating early voting. So the, the, our colleagues are aware that this was a consequence of that and I don't think that was well thought out with the early voting um, in that regard. But, uh, but that, again, and the other issue we have with early voting, you have its feast or famine. So you have uh, out by us, our early voting locations for the presidential election, there were lines around the block to vote early, uh, but then the, the odd year elections where you have local races on the ballot here, city council, no one's voting, nobody's showing up. You, you literally could walk in and there's no line whatsoever. So it makes you wonder why do we have to have, we have this? Thing. We had the same thing, the presidential election, we had a lot of early, yep. of here early voting and then others we don't. Right, some, right some, on some days, it, it's very, Correct. very unusual. Yeah. Uh, my, my aide, Sean, is here in the audience somewhere. He uh, signed up uh, for one of these past elections, I think it was the primary this year, one of the primaries, uh, to something that people don't account for. The, the ballots must be watched 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So that means you actually have to have staff on for the 10 days, 24 hours, at least two people have to watch the machines, one Democrat, one Republican. Uh, so, so these are all issues to make sure that, that the, these things are secured. So uh, we're gonna continue working on that. I will tell you, I've become a lot more pessimistic about my bill regarding taking voting out of the schools, uh, just by the fact that uh, the Democrat uh, co-sponsor had not reintroduced her bill. She now is retiring, I think. So, so, that, uh, so we'll continue those discussions, but there's gotta be local control. The ability, again, you guys can't close your school for 40 days. That's right. absurd, you know? Um, but we're gonna continue working the kinks out of this the best we can. I know that you guys have been having Is there anyone that we can go to to call or harass, right? Like, what possibly can we do? to push the bill further. Like, if we get as a community. Yeah, I, mean, I would say right now you do have allies. The PTA is an ally in this. You mentioned your parts of the PTA. Uh, the teachers are allies in this discussion. Uh, but again, uh, both parties that work in the board of elections have concerns because they want uh, accessible buildings that are uh, located within communities. So that, that is a, a pushback, uh, but then now again, if you introduce another solution, perhaps giving schools the ability to close if you have a special election. Again, not considering the fact that uh, early voting should not be in a, in my opinion, <coughs> and I, early voting should definitely not be in a school that's in service, that makes absolutely no sense. No sense. Uh, so if that issue was solved, we'd still have the issue of a regular, typical election, mm -hmm. one day, every once in a while, um, but then there is pushback from the education, and again, I'm very active in the education community on Long Island. Uh, the education community doesn't like the idea of having to perhaps make up a, a, a day. You know, if, if it was made like a snow day, they don't like the idea that we'd have, they'd have to expend one of those days and then come back a different day. So I, I think the virtual that, option now since COVID. I mean, that's you know, for that one could, day. I to mean, be honest, that could be the solution to everything. So that, that's, right. that's a good I point. mean, for one day for a primary, if and, that's what happens, if we had, and that would be in multiple schools, it wouldn't just be ours. So maybe right. Right. And don't and don't forget, we all, they also when we have that one day, they turned into professional development day. Yes. Yes. Or, unfortunately, so, teachers don't yeah. get off. Yeah. The staff, unfortunately. <laughs> so I also want to highlight that Assemblymember Smith is also our ranking minority member on the Education Council. Uh, the Education Committee, I should say. So he uh, is uh, definitely a, an education advocate, and, and he does a tremendous job. And I'm sure that we can maybe talk to uh, Assemblymember, the, the, the ranker, uh, I mean the, uh, the chair, yeah. Mike uh, Benedetto, and uh, he's a former teacher as well. Uh, so maybe we can have a discussion and go to New York State Education Department and see about getting them to help us uh, with this early voting uh, aspect. That would be great. Thank, you. thank you, I really appreciate thank it. And if there's anything that we can do, please, we will be more than happy to raise our voices and write letters and show up places. We're, we're happy to do that. Um, we just know that for the safety of our children, it needs to stop. Yep. Thank, thank you. you. So, so that's the uh, closing of our panels. And I wanna thank everyone uh, for coming out and uh, I especially want to thank uh, Ms. Esposito and her staff and uh, the custodian staff for hosting us. Thank you.
I really appreciate that. And to our staff, uh, you guys rock. There's nothing more I can say. And uh, thank you. Safe home, everyone. <laughs>